gas masks and then grenades. Gas masks and hand grenades. <laughs> Hey, hey, what is happening, YouTube? It's Gas Mask and Hand Grenades. I'm your host, Jeff. I got this guy with me right here, Mr. Scott Taysom from the band Cloak. Not to be confused, there's a couple other Cloaks. There's the San Francisco one, too, right? Um, yeah, they changed their name not too, um, not too far after we uh, became a band, so I'm not sure. Who was first? If it well, they were. I guess they were, but then when we started doing things, they changed their name to Succumb. So okay, it, it probably it might have been in the cards anyway for them to change a name, but I don't know if it was because we came up and they didn't want the same name. But yeah, oh yeah. So you guys are out of Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. And um, as I said to you when I approached you, um, I saw you at the pre part, uh, the pre show. For decibel fest and i want to say it was 19 right um yeah april 2019 i think yeah yeah and you know i, I wasn't even going to get go because you know there was a whole lot going on those next two days saturday and sunday there was a lot of major bands i wanted to see and i wasn't really like the only band i really knew on the pre-show was inter arma mm -hmm. that was a pretty heavy bill man once i got in there and caught it was you guys full of hell uh integrity that's right yeah, yeah. Ma okay. uh masters of pret no who was that mm, the, the, Philly band, the black uh, metal band that opened i can't remember devil De devil master yeah. devil master yeah yeah, Logan, that, too. yeah that was a cool show um, yeah i actually forgot that was 2019 until you mentioned it i thought it was 2018 but yeah we did a lot of touring in 2019 um and that was that was one of the earlier tours and uh it kicked off a tour we had in, in April of that year. Yeah, and I got to say, man, you guys really impressed me. Of the bands that night, I mean, everybody was heavy. Everybody was, you know, but it was, and it was varied. You had sort of the integrity punk thing going. You had the power yeah. violence noise thing with Full of L. But you, you guys in Inner Armor were the two bands that I was like, okay, these are the ones that I want to check out. So I grabbed um, a shirt and I grabbed uh, To Venomous Depths cool and i was really really impressed i don't, I think i might have as you were walking around after the show i think i tapped you on the shoulder and said hey man because i'm pretty sure it was max that was working the merch when i bought it yeah do with, with the super long hair yeah, yeah, yeah he usually did the merch back then um yeah cool man yeah that was a good show um i i forgot integrity was on it as well well they headlined it i think they so. headlined it yeah yeah it was, it was definitely a good crowd i remember i talked to albert from decibel after we played and uh, great guy great guy did you guys hang out for the whole show then did you stay for saturday and sunday or you uh, no we had to get going to the next dates so we just oh played. you were on that's right you were on a tour who were you with then uh we joined up with Wormwitch and you Auto on that run okay all right 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 we went, nice. out, we went out to the west coast for another festival out there uh psycho smoke out festival in la so we did okay. date out there yeah well tell me a little bit about cloak like the just give me give me a historical rundown of you guys got formed in 2015 uh yeah well 2013 officially and then really got going more in 2015 after some brief hiatus that we had but yeah me and sean met in um early 2010s and we started wanting to get together to jam on some ideas that were more it was more raw death metal some black metal we, we were jamming with another guy we kind of were figuring out what we wanted to do um and then we kind of had a hiatus because he had another kid and i was in a band called haunting at the time that was a death metal band um as as well as well as a few other hardcore punk bands and uh yeah so that was my kind of introduction into more death metal um playing and singing when i did haunting i did other metal adjacent and and kind of more thrash metal stuff before that but um 
you were pretty young, I would imagine, right? Like uh, 20? 23 in, in 2013. But um, okay, yeah. So we we started jamming pretty early. I did haunting. That kind of ran its course, and then me and him talked about wanting to get back and doing cloak because we already had the name. Um, and Max had been jamming with us as early as 2014. So it was a uh, that kind of trio was already established. And we, yeah, we, we got back in 2015 after haunting kind of did its thing. And, um, we've been going strong ever since, but that was 2015 was when we started getting serious about, um, you know, the vision of the band and the sound of the band. And we started writing the songs that became the songs for two venomous depths as early as, uh, March, 2015. So it's been nine solid years of, of doing, you know, this, mm-hmm formation of of the band um and then we had a guy named matt scott on bass originally and uh he left in 2018 and then we got billy of like april 2018 so um that first uh i think that tour that you mentioned was well no we did a a few before that but that was one of his first longer tours with us He'd he'd been in the band about a year at that point but um it's still that same lineup now right right um how how did the the deal with seasons come about when you were like you had two demos right uh we had a demo and then an ep Uh, the ep was released by a local label called boris records it had two songs that we re-recorded for the first album but that yeah that ep was um shared with season of mist and they liked it and offered a deal so we took that and did uh the three record deal with them right right and you know listening to i i didn't get a chance to go back to the venomous steps because i have that but i don't have the second one somehow i missed you mm-hmm. know how shit is dude so much comes out and you're yeah. trying to keep up with everything it's not that i didn't want it it's just i just didn't that, catch that, on one, to it. that one went a little under the radar because it came out october of 2019 and we all know what happened next so right. we couldn't do much touring on it obviously throughout 2020 2021 so we tried to pick up towards the end of 21 into 22 and did a little bit of touring on it, but it's kind of a lost record at this point. Um, yeah. it, did, it did all right. It did better than the first one as far as sales and uh, rec- like feedback and recognition, I think. But um, yeah, it's uh, it kind of just is what it is on that one. Yeah. Uh, not, not my favorite record, honestly, looking back, but yeah. Well, you guys weren't alone in that. I mean, everybody in the recording yeah. end as well. Everybody in the world was kind of fucked, right? You know what I mean? We just yeah, it was a, it was just a bad time. But we did a really good tour on that. The day that it came out, we did a tour with um, thirteen forty nine. So we did the whole oh wow U.S. with them, and that was uh, a really good tour for us. So we we did get to do one lengthy U.S. tour on it, but no no Europe yet. You know, Europe's. Coming. I was going to ask you that. Have you been? You haven't been to Europe as yet. Uh, this summer and fall are going to be European tours for us for the first time, finally. So, oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, are you doing any of the any of the festivals over the summer? Have you gotten any offers? Yeah, yeah we have. Uh, we've we've announced a few of them already. We announced one today, and then I think there's a ton that we're playing throughout um, July and August. Uh, I can't okay. really remember them all. I think we announced at least like four or five. And then we're going back in in the fall um, to do a tour with some festivals in that tour, but it's mostly a club show tour. So July and August will be festivals with club shows in between, joining up with some pretty cool bands in between. And then uh, the fall will be like a package tour. Now, I, you're just saying Europe exclusively. What about in the U.S.? Or is that partially that? Uh, that's, all, that's all Europe. U.S. so far this year, we're just doing Milwaukee Metal Fest. There might be be some dates around it but um nothing significant for the u.s we had a really cool opportunity that was going to happen but the tour fell through um just due to it it, you know stuff with the other band um just like logistics and stuff um which sucked because it was a good opportunity but maybe it'll come back around so you're doing milwaukee so that means you're not doing uh maryland yeah no maryland okay have you done have you done that before uh, no, we've never done Maryland Death Fest. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why the guys won't ask us to play it because we're pretty close. But Oh, man, I mean, that'd be a perfect, yeah, perfect place for you guys to play. Maybe yeah, yeah. maybe next year. I'll, I'll I'll put a bug in there. I'm going down. I know some guys in some bands that are playing this year. So Yeah, um, yeah man, so, like, 
we'll, we'll kind of get into this album a little bit. So this comes out in May, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and May um, six last year, yeah. What's that? May twenty six last year. Right. Well, last year. I'm, yeah. yeah I'm, we're only just in twenty four. Uh, Black Eternal Flame and uh, man, dude, riffs for fucking days on this album. Oh, just, right. just riff after riff after riff. Now I'm gonna ask the question you're probably dreading. When I announced this thing, I, I used gothic black metal, okay? Mm -hmm. And and one of the things I probably, the one band I would most liken you guys to, your sound to, that I hear, are you ready? <laughs> you probably heard this before, but I hear Tribulation. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, who we, I hear. Yeah, I think we shed that a bit on this last record. It kind of... That would be written up in reviews for our first two, but I didn't really see a lot of that in this last record. Um, I think this last record is heavier than anything they've done in the past 10 years. So oh, Yeah, it's definitely heavier. I, I think what I also hear on this album a lot, there's a lot of real black and thrash in here, man. There's mm -hmm. just some really – I don't – and I don't want you to take this the wrong way. I don't really hear a lot of like traditional black metal. Maybe some Emperor in there a little bit. But I'm not really hearing like Immortal or Dark Throne or, or yeah, those kind of bands. It's pretty different from that for sure. Um, yeah. I think just because we do our own thing and uh, like we're influenced by those bands and the spirit of black metal, but we we don't really stick to, you know, a box or a, the the formulaic black metal of just blasting right. and riffs throughout the whole song that's done a million times. So we try to right. really do our own thing. Um, yeah, all that yeah, minor. We, all that minor tremolo picking stuff. There's some of that on here, but it's not endlessly just tremolo. You know. What yeah, I mean? there's a lot of leads and there's a lot of solos, which isn't really very melodic. A thing that goes with a lot of typical black metal. Um, yeah, there's melody and, and yeah. hooks, hooks, big choruses, uh, and I think those are all the aspects of Cloak that set us aside from bands like that. Well, how did you? So you know, Atlanta. I don't know what the scene is like down there, to be honest with you. So. What's the scene like for a band like you, or or more the metal sphere of things, like maybe death, deathy black stuff? Is there a good scene down there? There's a scene, but it um, we're definitely the black sheep of the scene. There wasn't really a lot of bands that do stuff like we were doing in the South in general. Right. Um, I like the South. I like the scene here, but it's it's not. You know, Atlanta's never been like a, a fashionable scene. Like it's not a Portland. It's not a Seattle or a Brooklyn. Right. Or LA, but it it you know we have packed shows with every package store that tends to come through um you know it's a city it's a major city that bands will hit before they stop basically they don't a lot of them won't go down to florida yeah like atlanta's the most south they'll go yeah. on, on certain tours um so it's it's a hub for sure you know a lot of european bands come here because the international airport you got to fly in so we do get a lot of the the european tours um but yeah, it's it's a it's a unique scene for sure. It's it's again, it's it's it was never a hub for this style of black metal. Um, or you know, there are great black metal bands from here. Like Helga has been a band for over fifteen years. Van right, Mere band for over fifteen years, um, or or just about fifteen years, I think. But yeah, I mean, we have you got some death metal. You got like Father Be Foul. You got Justin down yeah. there. Um, yeah, there's, there's some death metal, um, some thrash metal and stuff like that. So um, our shows always did pretty well here. Uh, we, we were welcomed. Where would you often play? Are you playing like what? what's the big venue there? The show box or what, what's it called? Mm, the uh, Masquerade or the Masquerade. or uh, yeah, we did a lot of shows at those two places. Uh, there's Drunken Unicorn, 529, Boggs. Um, but yeah, Masquerade is the big touring venue that a lot of the package tours come through yeah um so in the band now when i saw you you're the only singer right yeah okay and, and what your your style is pretty unique man because it's it's there's a little bit of a black metal vibe to it but there's a little bit of a death metal vibe to it but yet there's also you can really understand what you're saying 99 percent of the time and you know, it's not a throaty rasp. It's kind of in between a rasp and a growl. Sure. Um, what What was kind of the influence to do it that way, or is that just how it how it started to come out? Was yeah, there any kind of? That's how it came out. I think if you listen to more 
of the older material, like the EP, especially, or to Venomous Steps, the first album, it's a little more unhinged, raspier. Um, and then I controlled it a little more on Dawn. And then I think I did something in between on the last record. Um, it's definitely my most, the, the most proud I've been of, of vocal takes is on Black Flame Eternal. And uh, yeah, I think it's just the way that I sing and I want to add a lot of emotion in it. I think when you just do the rasp the whole time, it's a super flat line and it just, right. there's no uh, peaks Dynamic. and peaks, dynamics. Um, there's not a lot of, I don't feel a lot of emotion behind that, but, um, but then again, I love bands. Like, I mean, I'm wearing a Judas Iscariot shirt. There's that's a total monotone vocal style, but it works True. for that music. If I were to do it, like Cloak is a pretty dramatic band musically. If I were to do just like flat, flat lined black metal vocals over, it just wouldn't work. So I'm just matching what the music is, which is pretty, uh, epic. It's epic. It's, yeah. it's dramatic. It's very, it can be like cinematic the, the way that we write riffs um you know and there is there is some gothic touch to it so i'm like like shadowland definitely has sort of a gothy kind of vibe to it by goth i don't mean like vampires and you know goth chicks or anything i'm just talking like just a feel like it's got this almost dreary ac yeah anachronistic other time feel to it you know what yeah, i mean sure. that song yeah. and, um you know like the break and uh the clean singing break and seven thunders and stuff yeah. like that but um yeah sure i mean it's very uh that's that's a very like bleak and dreary song it's slower um yeah again yeah, I, that's another good point you guys have dynamics where there are parts where you 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 don't it's not breakdowns traditional breakdowns it's just this a very ebb and flow type thing where the, the they, they're just not constant blast beats in yeah. fact there's you know i would say maybe only two thirds of the album has blasts on it. And they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're good blasts. They're not that constant in your yeah. face, you know, and some people like that. I'm, I'm kind of not into that kind of vibe, yeah. but that's why I like your, your music is very dynamic. And it's kind of like you said, cinematic and light and shade sort of vibes to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that just matches, you know, my personality as a, a person and a songwriter it meshes into that vibe. I'm very into film. Uh, as much as I'm into music, uh, oh, cool. and just gathering influence from life and, and nature and just the way to view the world. So I think that, you know, I don't want to do a band that doesn't have that dynamic of uh, that range of emotion. So, um, yeah, again, I just I think we just do, you know, vocally, I've always done what the music's called for. And just as the, the drummer has always done what the, the music's called for and he's helped shape the, the the riffs to what they you know what they should be um it's again he could, if he wanted to he could just play pummeling you know drum right cross over the whole thing but he doesn't so i think it that's something that sets us aside and I, I think like yourself a lot of people in interviews have brought that up or a lot of reviews have brought that up uh so i think the fact that it's brought up so much is is telling me that it's something that's noticed with our yeah. band yeah and, and you, that, that can also turn people off. Like a lot of people don't want that. They want just straight monotone. Yeah. Black metal, and that's fine. I mean, yep, there's yep. plenty of bands that I like that are, you know, a little more like that, but I think um, I'd like to think the ones that I'm into offer a bit more than just sterile music. So, uh, but yeah, a lot of people aren't into the, the dynamic of things, which is fine. So on that front, um, you, are you the sole writer or do you guys collaborate a lot? It, it's it's collaborative. I mean, I, I come up with most of the initial songwriting, but we always okay. bring it the into structures the structures. And then everybody just kind of yeah. does their own thing based on maybe your demos or something. Exactly. I do demos. Max does demos. We bring it in. We do the old school thing where we jam it. But typically the demos are pretty formed already. Um, you know, a song like Eye of the Abyss was 90 percent there and then we brought it in and added like we always need the band to come in and, and like fix things up and sure. add things so uh, shit always changes from the demos typically in the in the practice space but yeah so it's how it's, often how do you guys rehearse and practice like uh, we are preparing for a tour or something or not a tour as you're working on material or you're starting to think about new material is it like once every two weeks or once a week or three times good. a week weekly usually sometimes bi-weekly um and i'm always before we even got on here i was working on new material so i'm always doing stuff on my own but um mm -hmm. every, 
every day or every other day usually. But as far as the band, yeah, it's, it's weekly. Do you use um, Logic, Pro Tools? Uh, I actually use GarageBand. To demo. GarageBand? Okay, cool, cool. Um, what, um, what if you really had to like kind of go back? I'm sure that the things have dynamically changed over the years because you're considerably younger younger than me i'm 58 so almost 58 so um, i think I you're have never guessed what's that i would have never guessed i'm an old man <laughs> <laughs> but you're in your early 30s right uh yeah about to be 34 okay so your your influence is obviously you know i actually interviewed this this band today the the, the guitarist i don't know if you've ever heard of this band um I've heard of them, yeah. Yeah, so like Randy's like 10 years older than me. So we were talking about like his influences were like the Beatles and the early Stones and because he's coming through the 60s. I'm a 70s kid, so it's it's Kiss, it's Rush, it's yeah. Van Halen, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm I, curious. Love that. I love that shit. I was just listening to the Paul Stanley uh, audio book before we got on here. Like, oh, really? Yeah. Well, what? Okay, so what are your early influences and like where – what led you to, to kind of go down this path as far as the kind of music you wanted to play and write? Uh, my early influences were pretty different than what I'm doing now. Um, you know, when I was a young, young, young kid, Metallica was all over the radio and my brother was um, into, you know, alternative rock that was on the radio. He was older. So he had the black album, he had master puppets, but he also had things like the offspring Foo Fighters, uh, Green Day, um, and I gravitated towards towards like Green Day and Offspring when I was a young boy, like six. Sure. And I got into Corn and some of the new metal stuff that was happening when I was maybe nine or ten. And then I got after that, the trajectory was punk. So it was like early wow. AFI, um, early No Effects, like the skater type of punk stuff. That right. Was and then I got more into street punk and DB and English punk, like Discharge and GBH. And that was my thing for a long time was, was DB and Crust, like bands like Tragedy. That was kind of my introduction into heavier stuff. But as I was getting into all that, I was getting heavily into thrash as well. So I was into Slayer, Rain and Blood, Metallica, Kill Em All. Um, all, all their early records I loved. Yeah. But those were the ones that really changed a lot of the trajectory of kind of how I viewed the guitar and, you know, how I viewed vocals. I got in, you know, the first black metal stuff I got into was Venom and then Bathory. So I went in order when it came to yep. black metal and then dissected. You did the historical sort of trek through it, yeah. Well, yeah, because I was so into Metallica and Slayer and they referenced Venom. So I got into Venom. Sure, Venom. they played, they did covers of, you know, Venom and Merciful yeah. Fate, I would imagine, too, to some degree. Yeah, Merciful Fate, I got into probably like early 20s. Um but yeah, Metallica, Slayer are still my favorite bands. You know, they're top top five, five or ten for sure. Um, so do you still yeah. buy the? Do you buy the new Metallica? Like I got to be completely honest with you. I don't. I literally have. I literally have not checked the last two out, other than one or two tracks. And I was just like, yeah, it did. You know, coming from the era that I came from, you you can understand. I mean, that yeah, was. Sure. I yeah. bought. I bought Master of Puppets. Like. A, a day or two i saw them open for ozzy oh awesome yeah on that tour yeah so, yeah so that was the tour and i didn't really know about them but they were i, I walked in we were out in the parking lot getting fucked up or whatever <laughs> and you know what you, what you do and yeah. uh and we went in and they were wrapping up a sanitarium and i was uh -oh. like whoa what the? and then they did the master of puppets in sanitarium we were just catching the end of master of puppets i'm like Whoa, who the hell? Now, I, and then when somebody's like, oh, that's Metallica, I'm like, oh, is that the band that Kill Em All band? So I was just starting to drift in that because I was also into Fate's Warning and, you know, that kind of that kind of metal, the Dream the early Dream Theater. Yeah. Stuff like that. yeah um, Queen's Rake and stuff like that. Oh, big time. Queen's Rake, huge, yeah. huge. Um, huge. Operation Mindcry, Warning. Ah. Rage and I love Warning. Them. Warning's my favorite. And the EP, yeah. obviously. Yeah. I love yeah. Rage too. A lot of people don't really rate rage like I do. I think it's fucking awesome. Yeah, I got I got really into that one more. So like last year I was jamming it more and that that's a great record. I didn't get it at first, but uh yeah, they're doing that warning tour this year, which should be cool. Yeah, very good. Todd, have you seen him with Todd? Yeah, I saw him open for Priest uh like two years ago. Yeah, he's great, man. And I mean I got to see him 
I got to see them on the Rage Tour open for Ozzy too on the Ultimate Sin. Yeah, that's and awesome. they were all they all looked like Phyllis Diller, man. They had like so much <laughs> makeup and fucking yeah. you know, weird stuff. It was so funny. But um, so tell me, when did you pick up the guitar? Was that the first? instrument you you got into or yeah, I, was, I was 10 i picked up a guitar and a skateboard around the same time so i was i was a skater kid you know as i was born in 90 so right when 2000 hit was sure. when tony hawk era of things x yep. era was huge so um that influenced my musical tastes all the tony hawk soundtracks and, and skate videos first time i ever heard slayer iron maiden motorhead uh maybe misfits was all from skate videos and the, and the Tony Hawk soundtrack. I didn't really pinpoint that until later in life, but those are super important pivotal moments. Yeah, pivotal for sure. But at the top, like I didn't really put the pieces together until more recently, but yeah, I mean like a zero video had a, had a Slayer song in it. It was like a, a aggressive perfecter, I think. And, um, but yeah, so anyways, I picked up the guitar when I was 10. So in 2000 and um, yeah, it just went from there. I formed my first band in 2003. We were 13. Um, wow. Yeah. And, and we now, were, when, you, when you picked up the guitar, were you, was it the thing where your parents are like, hey, we'll buy this acoustic, but you got to learn that and, and then you can move on? Or was it, did you right away grab an electric, a cheap electric? Or how? Yeah, how it was that? one of those uh, crate electric packs where they come with yeah. the guitar and the amp, which yeah, a lot yeah. of kids, you know, that's an easy way for parents to spend not too much money to make sure get you started yeah so i took lessons um did you yeah i gave up after a year because he was having me learn like mary had a little lamb and i wasn't about that i wanted to learn like green day songs or right what a 10 year old wants to learn so um yeah and then and then i for some reason maybe my parents convinced me or i was just like oh i want to try it again maybe my best friend at the time was also a player so we uh we, we took lessons with this other guy and he was much cooler and he taught us just songs we wanted to learn. Um, it probably stunted my growth as a player a little bit because I just learned like these punk songs that really weren't hard to play. Right. Had I been into more extreme metal when I was that young, it would have been like, I would have been a better, I kind of had to teach myself that. And I'm still, I, I don't view myself as the best guitarist at all. Um, but I'm pretty confident in, in songwriting. And I think those are kind of two different things you can yeah. do to get as a songwriting tool which i typically yeah. do yeah um but yeah I, i've never been like an extreme shredder or anything i've had to teach myself to do leads if, if we need them but max is a great player as well so we just bounce ideas off each other who are, but, uh, who are the players that most maybe like now looking back would be obviously headfield and kirk guys like that maybe carrie king and hanneman and guys like that yeah. are there any like outliers like you know I mean, I I don't want to shit on B Billy. What's his name? Billy. What's the last name of the guy? Our bass player? No, the guy in Green Day. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Joe Armstrong. Billy Joe Armstrong, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's a great player. I have no idea. It's just not – it's something that passed me by. Well, it's I'm just not, punk. Like, it's mostly just chord stuff. It's like the Ramones. Yeah, yeah, which is what I was – when I was that young, that's what I was learning is power chords and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, no, honestly, like I grew up in a – in, in sort of a, a scene where there were no guitar heroes, like punk wasn't about that. It was more about yes. attitude and, and um, you know, anger and emotion and aggression. So like, right. I didn't really have guitar idols. I, I until a little old, like I love Hatfield. I love um, Adrian Smith from Iron Maiden, oh, yeah. uh, KK Downing and, and Glenn Tipton, obviously, but still I, I, you know, I have the guys that I like, um, but I've never been like a super fanboy. Boy, like the, the Vi, Satriani, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, like that. that stuff's awesome. And like Malmsteen is awesome. Obviously, they're great players, but uh, like Richie Blackmore, I love. From oh, yeah. Michael TV. Shanker. Yeah, for sure. Um, but again, like it just, you know, if something were uh, more about the, the, the vibe of the entire song. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I do, I do think a really underrated guitar player is Wolf Hoffman from Accept. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really good. And, you know, it's funny. I mentioned Shanker, and you mentioned Blackmore. And and while Blackmore did kind of spearhead that neoclassical thing that Uli took to the next level, and then, you know, Ingve kind of took beyond that level, 
the thing is, like with guys like you look at like Eddie Van Halen or yeah. even Michael Schenker, neither of those guys ever were doing the you know the the sweeping and the the crazy fucking like you know Eddie obviously had his tapping thing and he had that crazy rhythm that right hand, but Schenker same deal, not a sweeper, not a yeah he's just a super melodic player. Neil Sean, great fucking player that just yeah. you know plays killer melodies right killer solos right george lynch one of my favorites ah oh yeah, yeah. talking um, now he does the sweeping thing a little bit but it's not for sure but it's it's tasteful yeah and it's yeah. not it's not the sweep sweep it's more of a kind of a quasi hybrid yeah. sort of sweep if you watch him where he he adds in a lot of the you know the tapping and stuff like that i mean the the uh solo on tooth and nail come on yeah yeah, yeah. Jesus it's christ yeah. like uh, i was so, uh, Drop that title, to, yeah, for sure. And just uh, to me, it's just his guitar tone was so great, huge part of it, right? Yeah, yeah I, I actually got to talk to the guy who mixed uh, um, under lock and key and back for the attack when we were looking for mixers. So I nerded out a little bit about that. Who was that? Uh, Neil Corman, I think. Kernan, Neil Kernan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he did, I believe Neil Kernan did. Um, he produced then later. He produced like um, uh, fucking Nevermind, man, or not Nevermind, uh, Nevermore. Okay, yeah. yeah. He did Animal Corpse, like he did a lot of yep. death metal later on. But in the eighties, he was doing them and like Hollow Notes and huge acts like that. So it was pretty interesting. So you you have your first band at thirteen, and I imagine it's just sort of a jam band where you're doing like punk tunes, right? We were pretty serious, like we. Good? Yeah, I was always super serious about, like, we were goofy kids, goofy skater kids, but when it came to music, it was serious. Like, we we wrote songs, like, we covered songs in the beginning, but only, like, a couple, and we started writing really, really early. Um, I was just talking to someone about that the other day, how I wish I could kind of go back into that mindset and, of like, how we wrote as little kids like that. It's kind of funny to think about, but we were writing songs. Um, wow. And, we did that all the way. We had that band from 2003 to like 2009. So I had it, it went through a lot of changes. So 13 and 19. That's a yeah. So all, all through high school, all through high school and then early college. But yeah, we were playing shows. Like we played masquerade back then we played, um, you know, like we had some wow. cool shows. We opened for like some street punk bands that we were into at the time. And we that's would crazy. Do, yeah. It was, it was like a, a real band. What was the name we, of it? It was called Nothing Lost. We we Nothing weren't lost. Um, looking back, you know. It was raw and you know sounded like fifteen year old kids. But it, it yeah, That's I cool. mean, we, we took it seriously. Uh, you said you went to college. Was that after you got out of school? You decided to to go to college. Did you, did you finish college or? or yeah, I went, to, I went to an art school here called SCAD um, and okay. did film and TV production. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I want to ask you about film before we wrap up then, because I'd be interested to hear what you're into. We'll, we'll get that in a minute. Um, how are you doing on time? Are we good for another 30 minutes, roughly? Or Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess the, you know, you get out, you get out of school, you're in college, and is that, like, you said that was to 2009? Uh, that's when that band ended. I got out of college in 2012. 12, okay, so... What at that point? What are you doing at that point, as far as a, as a band or as far as a creative outlet? Are you is that because it's a little pre cloak yet, right? Yeah, I was in a band called In Ruins after my first band that I mentioned, and that was more that was the band that I mark as real songwriting, as adding layers and adding leads and getting more obscure with lyrics, heavier singing. Um, it was a band called In Ruins and. It was more like crust, uh, metal punk, sort of. Um, it's on Bandcamp, uh, and you can definitely hear, I think it's on Spotify, too. You can definitely hear some, It's it's got me in it, so you can hear Cloak mm -hmm. a little bit, like pre-Cloak. Um, not, not fully, but um, it's there a little bit. And then after that, I had a band called Paradox. It was more like raw D-beat stuff. Um, and then we, and then I did haunting. Like I was in a lot of bands in between that. These are just my my main bands. Yeah, tell um, me about haunting. I mean, I know I've heard that name before. Um, can you? Yeah, I, but I don't know them. What what were they all about? 
So that was a death metal band formed by, um, there was a band called Living Decay from Atlanta that did pretty well locally. And then a band called Sadistic Ritual that's still together doing really good music. They, those guys came together and did a band. Um, I wasn't, it wasn't my band. I wasn't in the initial lineup, but uh, they needed a singer uh, and a guitar player. And I became pretty close with the guy, David, at the time. Mm -hmm. David introduced me to Max, who is our guitar player now. So that it, it all kind of worked out. Um, and David jammed early cloak with me and Sean. So we were kind of, we were just friends and playing and he was teaching me things, um, showing me music and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, that was early twenties and I was jamming with him. I did the haunting EP, um, which is, it's out there. It's up on Spotify and stuff. We did, we did a record, uh, same label that released the first cloak EP did that record. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And so that, I mean, that was short. We played a couple shows. Um, maybe lasted like a year or less uh with me in it but um we came back we did like one other show in 2016 i think uh with sean on drums but yeah it was just kind of this weird like gateway into transitional sort of band kind of. how how yeah what kind of got cloak to be it was cloak came together in a really unconventional way and it, it was almost like it was meant to happen, but it, it shouldn't have happened. Like it was. Yeah. What do you mean? It's very strange. Just, just the way that I met all these guys. Um, Cause I, I, I'd been used to jamming with guys that I knew my whole life. I'm still friends with the guys that I had my first band with. I, I grew up in the, there were all in the same neighborhood. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it was just, it was just different. Like I met these new guys and, you know, I had been active in the scene and punk and metal and doing, booking shows and flyers. I was always very active, but these guys weren't part of that immediate scene that I was in one, you know, Max was a lot younger. Okay. Sean was older. So I was in between and we kind of met in, in just this like weird way. Um, you know, I was working in a pizza shop with this guy, Nate, and he wanted to jam and I kind of knew Sean and I said, well, let's just get this guy to drum with us. And I remember being like amazed at his drumming because he, he could, he was doing all this crazy shit that I wasn't used to because I was playing again, like raw, or DVD, rock, yeah. super aggressive, crazy shit. And then, but Sean was really controlled and he could play really fast too. Cause we were doing a bit faster music. Um, we were really into bands like bastard priest and like, like, yeah. In tune style death metal and stuff like okay. that. But, but then we were really into dark throne and like Burzum and dissection too. So that it was kind of that middle ground of stuff like that. But, yeah, you were transitioning was, into that first wave stuff for the most part, or and no, I, was, I was into black metal as early as I guess nineteen or twenty with the second wave stuff. I, I really am. I'm not really a death metal head. Like I, I love certain. Like I listen to the first DSI today. I love death metal, but I'm really picky about it. I'm more. I'm definitely more of a black metal guy. But we wanted for some reason we wanted to do more of like a death metal band in the beginning, and it wasn't like a old school death metal thing that became so popular in the U S like, yeah, yeah. It, it was just like our version of it. Um, but no, yeah. And then we gravitate, we all gravitated more towards black metal. Um, the stuff. Well, and then you can also hear one of the bands I didn't mention that I'm sure is an influence. You can definitely hear some, some dissection in what's yeah, going on from the melodic, the melodic guitar motifs yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff like that. So those bands like Dawn and, yeah, I was really into really, really into dissection when I first heard them. Um, still am, but I was it was they were life changing for me. Um hearing the song really in and then getting into uh Storm was just life changing. So now if you had to pick Storm. Okay. Yeah. Every time over Somberlane? Yeah, Storm is arguably my favorite. Like it's top five records for me. Yeah. Um, it's it's in there. So it's what's it's, what's your what's your feelings on Raincast? I love Rain Chaos. You see, a lot of people shit on it, and I don't really have that opinion of I don't love it. I didn't it's, love not it. The, it's not on the par of the first two albums, but it's yeah. still a pretty good album, I think. I, a lot of people shit on it. I think it's amazing, it. and if people really got what he was singing about, they might get it a little bit more. But it, to me, it's um, – it's. I love that record. I, it's super important. Uh, it's important for the guys in Cloak. Uh, more people have related Black Flame Eternal to that record than any other. Yeah, um, I definitely hear. I definitely hear a lot of it. Yes, yeah, for sure. And like it's we we again we don't sit down and say we want to sound like this or that. I I am pretty. It's just it just now it works out, man. You you know yeah. you 
you play guitar, you listen to certain things. Just to, you know, the original riff started whenever the first guitar came out, and ever since then, it's just been copies of that. You know what I mean? You, it's how you write the song, yeah. But you only have twelve notes, so what are you yeah. gonna do? You know There's I mean? only so many notes that make dark music, too. Exactly. So, like I, I kind of joke that I've written the same. I've written with the same chords for twelve songs. Like <laughs> I, yeah. I kind of have, but yeah. form them in different ways. There's only again, we're tuned in D standard. There's only, only so many things you can do to make a dark sounding. Riff. Okay, so you guys are in D standard. I was wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you messed around with any D? Any like uh detune stuff like going lower or dropping your like no, dropping no, your no. No. I was in a in runes was in C standard and that was the lowest I went. I think D is is perfect That's great. For our yeah. style. Yeah. I'll tell you what though, I'm not gonna lie to you, man. You can make E heavy, man. E can be very, oh, yeah. very yeah. I mean uh I think uh classic yeah. example is Opest uh deliverance, that last bit in deliverance, it's just like yeah. slamming and that's all in e you know what yeah, I, mean? I think dissection was e Watain is e still yeah. sounds heavy yeah um so you guys how did you said uh that the ep got to somebody at at seasons yeah mike uh yeah so it got to a couple of the u.s guys and then they passed it on to michael who's the, the head guy in france and we had a phone conversation went from there we were young, out, 20, I was 26, and we were just like, yeah, super excited. Yeah, I would imagine. It's like a, a kind of a big thrill, right? Especially for the first record, because a lot of bands aim to get on that label later on, and we were we were lucky, for sure. Yeah. It was a bit of luck and a bit of extremely hard work and a bit of how we presented the band. We, I think we did it in a fairly smart way, um, the way that we rolled out everything. You know, we, we rolled out things online and kind of built a little bit of, of attention around it. And, you know, we released pictures, then we did the EP, then we did a show. So we, we had music out there um, before the show. Do you have a manager or do you self-manage? Do you manage? Uh, we have one now. We didn't back then. Okay. You got to that point where maybe some things that are going to be happening soon might necessitate that then? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. Well, we we've we've had the same guy since I think the first album onward. But um, yeah, and I, I mean I have a heavy hand in, in a lot of the management side of things anyway. So he helps us with with tours and stuff like that. And then who do you who does your booking then? Do you have agents that you you have that yeah. are working on? Yeah, yeah. TKO. Yeah. What um, what are you some of your favorite places to play so far that you've been to? Um, I mean. It kind of it kind of depends. I mean, we've had great shows in Brooklyn, but we've also had great shows in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, where'd you play in Pittsburgh? Uh, we uh, played at Black Forge Coffee before, and then we played Mr. Smalls um, or Jurgles. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember the last one. We, it was in September, but uh, yeah, I don't really have. It depends. I don't really have a favorite place. Um, my favorite show on the last tour was probably Vancouver. Uh, it was a really nice venue and a good response and a good crowd. And you did a whole West Coast tour, like up down California? And we did a whole U.S. tour in September, okay. five and a half was, weeks. Was that the one with Uata or not? Yeah, that was another one. Okay. Yeah, Uata, man, that's a cool band, man. I mean, I, I really like them quite a bit. Jake seems like a Jake seems like a cool fucking dude. Yeah, it was a good tour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a little bit, I guess, in a weird way, there's a bit of chemistry there between your music and their music. There's some kind of vibes because they're, you know, they, although they have, you know, the dissection thing and maybe the McGuaw thing going on or whatever, they have their own Cascadian sort of vibe, which you guys don't quite fit into that. Yeah. Bucket, right. But, but you guys have a lot of melody in your, your yeah. darker, darker music. And I uh, wanted to ask you what, what, um, you both you and max use less pause right used to now we use uh flying bees mostly oh really yeah yeah, yeah what, recently, made, you, what uh, made you make that change yeah i don't know i just got into different shapes and i i my two that i switched like i was a less paul fanatic it was all i would play but um like around 2020 i wanted to switch to uh explorer which i love my explorer it's a gibson and then i have a gibson gothic v 
Okay. That's what I've been using on tour. It's a lot lighter to tour with. Uh, it's a lot more comfortable to play. Um, my Explorer probably sounds the best though, but it's really, really heavy. What Explorer? What year is your Explorer? Uh, I think it's an O2. Okay. Yeah. My very first electric yeah. guitar was a 1985 uh, Explorer with uh, Demarzio humbuckers and the very, very yeah. first year of the Kaler Trem system. Okay. And it had a Kaler Trem on it, man. And I had to sell that thing to pay rent. I was living with two dudes uh, in college and I, I just got, I was flat broke. And I, I, man, I gave that fucking guitar away. I would like, I literally gave it away for like 400 bucks. It's probably worth three, 4,000. Yeah. Even. It's probably worth like 5,000 now, especially with that, that trem system on yeah, it. It was yeah, amazing. Yeah. It was the candy apple red with white pick guard. So it was very U2 edge U2 looking, you know what I mean? That's why I was kind of into that at the time. But, um, yeah, and you you had a black lust, Paul. Was that a black beauty? Yeah, so it was actually in Orville. We have knockoffs. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. the the Les Pauls, and then Max had a Greco because the Gibsons were like twenty five hundred bucks back then. Yeah, they're crazy. Now they're like four thousand. But uh, yeah, I, I grew up playing like an Epiphone Les Paul, and then I I found that Orville. I love it. it. It's still such a great guitar. I always mod all my guitars out. I put a local guy, Avedisian Pickups, does our yeah. Model. So I just really actually, I just picked this up not too long ago. You're not going to be able to see it real well. Oh, cool. Cherry Red. But, uh, Jerry Cantrell. Awesome. And That's it's an Epiphone. And, you uh, know, I played I played four customs, and I was like, there's no fucking way I'm dropping six grand on this thing when this plays almost as nicely. I think it it's a little heavier, a little beefier, but it's that burgundy. Uh, it's got birth buckers in it. It's fucking slamming guitar. I really like it, man. Yeah, they make good stuff. The, the only thing that I like about the Gibsons is is I just love that open book headstock as opposed to yeah. it just looks so much cooler. But like, whatever, it plays. Again, I have a knockoff Orville. It's a I see you got a, gu a bunch behind you there, right? Um, yeah, just stuff I demo with. Like, this is, this is just a cheap LTD. Okay. C1000, but it's the easiest guitar to play, so I love demoing with it. And nice. I don't use actives live, but since when I demo, I like the actives because they push it. Through. Give you a lot of give you a lot of pop. Yeah, the EMGs, right? Yeah, eighty eighty ones probably. Yeah, I I can't remember the exact model. I just kept them in as is. But um, yeah, this is my. I've written. I mean, all black limbs mostly. Written. No way. Oh yeah. Just through this computer when I demo, but yeah. And then, yeah, again, we use, so we use like these now, and then occasionally I'll use the Explorer, but Max has a white V that he found for a good price. Um, now, did you say you're using like legit Gibson Vs or? Yeah, now we are, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we stepped it up. <laughs> I, um, I'll um, tell you my favorite though. I, I just bought a bunch of stuff because I came into a settlement for something, and my favorite guitar is this one. Oh, cool. What, what is that? The oh, Dean Cadillac, yeah. which everybody's yeah. like, oh, man, that's the stupidest body design ever i'm like no man it's like half a les paul and kind of half of an explorer yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the best of both worlds right and this yeah. has uh demarzio i can't remember what the marzios are in this that's got the it's got the licensed floyd so far so good no problems with it um yeah, i'm also a prs guy so okay. i have a prs that i love that's kind of my baby but yeah so what uh so what kind of plug-in stuff are you using then we're minimal uh, pedals. It's like literally just reverb, delay, and and um, phaser for me. I think Max has the same. But no, you're talking about live. You're talking about live. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're talking about plugins for. Well, demo. I was talking about plugins, but so what do you use amp wise? Are you using Marshalls or what do you? Um, sixty five oh five, and then I okay. actually have a Black Star, which I know a lot of people don't like, but I mine has always sounded really good for me. What is it? I'm sorry. A Black Star. Oh, Black, Black Star makes good stuff, man. Yeah, I like it. It's and it's the the older I've gotten, the more I've realized whatever works on tour is better than something that might be a little higher end, but it's gonna fucking break on tour. So yeah, like, yeah. These are usually really beefy, and they can withstand a lot of moving. And I've never had an issue with my amp, knock on wood. So I just keep it as it is, and it, it works. Like I like the tone. Um. It, it, so again, it's mostly the tone of the amp. You're just using a reverb and maybe a little delay. Do you use delay or anything like that? Yeah, for leads and stuff. We're, 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 we've never been a pedal band, so leads will crank on a delay. We'll crank on a reverb. That's about it. What are you using delay-wise? using like a boss or? No, it's the um, 
I think Max has a boss. I have the, uh, the, um, I forget that they make the hall of fame and the, the Strymon TC electronics. Oh, TC. Okay. Yeah. 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 I so, just picked up, I don't know. And the reason I ask about your plugins, I imagine you probably just use stuff that you can pull off the internet. I would assume. Yeah. Right? yeah. Stuff. It's when well, I'm you using like right? amplitude or what, what reaper or what? No, I garage band. Oh, garage band. Oh, so you're yeah. using those plugins. Yeah. No, I, oh, I, I downloaded one. It's the uh, emissary. Okay. Yeah. It sounds decent for what it is. I've gotten pretty good with garage band so I can make, I actually can make our demos sound pretty good with, with the drum machine and stuff. Did so, you learn it from somebody or did you just teach yourself? Taught myself. I, Cause I did video editing and it's all like timeline editing. Oh, right. Time. Right. So, um, I yeah. just got a quad cortex. You know what those are? No. It's the, um, let's see if I can grab it here. Probably. I'm actually, I'm not too much of a gear head. Like I, again, I just find what works and, uh, well, this, this thing's the, the neural DSP. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's the, you know, I have the Petrucci and the Gojira and the Mesa two rectifier. I still don't know what the fuck I'm doing with it. Cause I'm old and you know, that kind of stuff like, is i'm i'm dangerous i'm getting there but it's it's a pretty pretty amazing thing because literally you can go out plug that into to a pa and a PA and, and you're done there's no i'm more and more tempted to get just a smaller head to sit on just for touring sake and traveling and flying but there's something about having a nice big 100 watt amp that's yeah and we're we're pretty traditional band and in, in, in the kind of classic sense of things we we try to honor metal and rock tradition. Yeah, you like feeling the air behind you. Yeah, and just but fuck, man, like having one of those to travel with is is probably nice. But um, yeah, well, they're pretty cool at this point. But I think at some point, a lot of a lot of guys are going to them, especially for like flying gigs. They're just like, you know, you're either doing that or you're waiting on backline from some venue that you go to that you have no idea what yeah, you're doing. Yeah. I've seen some that are that sound fine too. Eventually, I might get one just for flying, like for Europe and stuff. But we'll see. Have you guys played Philly yet? Oh yeah, a bunch. We're, we're at Kung Fu. Uh, played there. Played uh, uh, Underground Arts. We played. Are oh, you played UA? Okay. The venue that you saw us at. Um, well, Fillmore, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we played. The one last time was a. Uh, smaller um it was like upstairs uh fuck what was it called um it was really small oh uh uh milk boy yeah 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 not my favorite but nah it's not it's not the greatest venue it's cool it's cool for fans because you get kind of up and pl up close and personal but yeah i can imagine for you guys it's gonna like yeah, a, a not, the best sound. Uh, not the best load off situation either you have to walk through everything but oh, it's fine we're we make it work um yeah, we played Philly a bunch, probably over six times now, six, seven times. Nice. Yeah. Well, hopefully you get back, man, because when you do, I'll I'll come down, we'll we'll hang out, I'll grab you a beer. But um the a couple quick more questions here, and then we'll I'll let you get out of here for the night. Um did uh do you ever like when you started performing, did you did you have like performance anxiety at all or any kind of like you know nerves or do you are you pretty just get out there and just go? Yeah, I, I never got it really for for that type of stuff. Like uh, again, when we were 13, 14, we played the school talent show for the first time. So that was, that was probably the most nerve wracking thing. Yeah. In front of a lot of people too, for us, um, but you but know, excited. you get the adrenaline. I, I, I love going on stage, but I think if we do bigger European festivals in front of those huge crowds, I, I might get yeah. a, little, a little more stage fright. Um, but you're, you're pumped up before. Um, kind of, I, I, know people and bands that have done those and and they're kind of like they've all often said that it's more the the small club shows are more nerve-wracking because you're right you're right there everybody can see when you're fucking up and they yeah. they know what's you know the train wreck can happen right there whereas those giant crowds once you walk out it's an adrenaline rush but then they're so far out there to a degree you know they're 25 30 40 feet out in front of you yeah it's a weird there's like a weird wall where you're almost like playing to the the airspace in front of the crowd then you hear the the mat so it'll be interesting to see how that works out for you guys like yeah sometimes i'll look out and it like we'll, we, we play fairly large shows at fests and stuff like that and sometimes 
it is strange. Like you'll kind of leave your body or your headspace for a second and just be like, Whoa, like this. Yeah. Is, it's, it's a little weird. And the older I get, I kind of get into that. And then I have to like bring myself back because you'll kind of forget what you're playing. Um, <laughs> so maybe I do. Yeah. Maybe I have it a little more now. Um, you think about it a little bit more maybe than you. Yeah. You just, yeah. just kind of weird uh sometimes but now that i put it in your head you can be like that fucking guy on gas pass man he yeah. made me think about this shit yeah <laughs> but i always like to ask everybody like what their take on that is because i struggle man with anxiety in front of mm -hmm. i can do this thing and 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 as long as i'm not like the focal point suddenly where everybody's eyes are on me i used to do uh hr management and i had to get up in front of like 400 people and do like these things and i'd be like fucking skitzing like just yeah, freaking yeah. like public I don't, is totally different than yeah yeah and it, i think it is when you when you can when you can kind of lock in on looking at your guitar neck or looking at the dudes in the band and then go out and look out and then come back to your guitar or focus on you know your your lyric delivery or your singing i think it's a different sort of vibe than when you're like so totally exposed speaking to everyone and everyone's hanging on the word that you're saying because you know at bars man people are if you're playing a club most people are drinking most people are pry buzzed a little bit right yeah. so they're not really like super picking you apart yeah there's going to be that one guy that's like you know watching and sort of you know critiquing or whatever but you guys live man i was i was really impressed with you guys live i, I thought yeah. you really came across like a really huge band like like you know what i mean try to, do, try to do a professional show but we really are try to do really high energy shows like again with we go out there like a punk band like we don't play to a click we don't right the samples behind us we go out and just fucking go for it because that's what the music calls for so it's not this like computerized thing where the well, okay so I, I let me interrupt that i want to ask you about that i'm glad you brought that up the the new album does have some synths on it. It's got some keys in the background, right? Yeah, yeah, a good bit. But live, what are you gonna do with that? They're just out. We just four of us live. That's how okay. It so live is live. The record's the record, and that's always how I've looked at it. Like I love layering stuff on all on my demos. All the layers are already built before we even go in and do it. So we just make it more professional on the. Do you record. play the keys? Do you do plugins yeah. to do that stuff? Tons of MIDI stuff um, is already built out. We just make it sound better for the record, obviously, and have, have a more professional guy build some stuff out. We'll do real piano and some real cello in the past. Um, always real piano on, on all of our records. But, uh, yeah, live is live. We just go out and we just play it like a band. You don't lose – you really don't lose that much in the live atmosphere if you don't have the samples either. Yeah. Do, are you um, – do you, you have a day job? um yeah we do i do i do stuff in the day but um me and max are actually about to start more of a, a company together like graphic arts something in that range or uh, screen printing yeah oh nice nice cool yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah where do you get your shirts done uh we we print our shirts you do them yourself yeah so the unless you're buying it from the label or our web shop which is uh downright merch we all of our tour merch is through us yeah. So, so you have actual screen printers? Like one of you guys has a screen printer? Yeah, we Max works at a at a screen printing place and we're about to, like I said, open our own shop. Oh nice. Their partner. So we're gonna all of our merch from tour is done by us. And it's all professional gear. It's oh yeah, it's good, auto. man. I've got I got a shirt. It's, it looks great. Yeah, man. It's all auto machines and um, but again, like when you order online through those web stores, that's someone else printing. But if you're ordering from our band camp, that's it's our shirts, which is okay. More so probably. if you got some through season, so just go to Bandcamp to get those those shirts because you got you got yeah. some killer looking designs, man. Did you did you do all the designs or? Yeah, I do. I do all the layouts for the shirts, um, not the art itself, but the the layouts. I've done record layouts and stuff in the past. Um, so yeah, I, I can do graphic design as well. Um, let's see. Uh, what's so? What's you know the album came out in May, so we're fast approaching a year now you're gonna get out and tour that or is there new material in the works or what yeah what you know, we're, we're kind of back into writing a new album um i want to do it quicker than the last album so i, I set a goal for like a year to give us to write it mm -hmm. which would be nice like if we were in the studio this time next year that'd be great that's the goal um 
who knows if it'll happen. You don't want to force it, but that's, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it. Uh, we, we've been pretty, pretty good with new songs so far. Um, yeah. The shelf life of a record is like six months these Isn't days. Isn't that terrible, man? It's yeah. It sucks. Uh, we toured it and we did a huge U S tour. That was kind of it. And then we're going to Europe later this year. And that, right. like, that's, whatever else we get in between, but that's like the main cycle is this, this year. And that's, kind of, you know, the year in between the record, but um, you do stuff in between. I'm sure we'll do, we'll still be touring this record, you know, after we record the next one, because when you record a record, you have to wait six months before it comes out anyway. So we'll be, yeah. we'll still be promoting black flame eternal for probably the next two years at least, but it's weird. Like the shelf life of, of, a, of the hype of a record is, is yeah. Not it's really not i'm not even sure it's six months you might be actually overselling yeah, it a little months. bit Maybe i mean did. three to four is usually what it seems yeah. to be which um but i will say that like looking at a lot of the different online mags decibel i mean this album scored very high it was very well received and yeah. you know it's a great album i i like i had it number 20 of 23 simply because i didn't get it until mid-november and i didn't have a tremendous amount of time to sit with it. And I'm thinking, I'm listening to it yesterday. I'm like, why the fuck did I have this number 20, man? This should have been like maybe like 12 at the worst. But a lot of good music came out. And I and I don't just do metal. I do, you know, like my number five was Stephen Wilson. I'm, you know, Porcupine Tree. I don't know if you know him. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So, I mean, like prog, that kind of stuff. Like okay. I'm a yeah. bit of a prog dork to a degree. And a local band here, I had it number three because they put out a killer killer album and they're kind of like a i don't know just just a killer rock band you know so it's, it's it's not all metal all the time for this old guy otherwise i'd get very it would get kind of stale for me so sure and and i think um you know stating your influences cloak is a band that uh people that aren't just into black metal like cloak i would say more of the snooty black metal fans don't like cloak and more of the well-rounded metal or classic rock fans like cloak so we're kind of yes. this really band but again like i'm a total black metal head it's still my favorite type of music i love the raw stuff i love this early second wave first wave stuff but the music i want to make is pretty contemporary and modern and and has dynamic and epic uh, epic nature to it so it's it's yeah. it's weird like i i just I don't have to or want to make all of the stuff that I'm into. I want to do something that's that's going to stick and, and be just different and make me feel something. Yeah, I mean, you bring up Lynch. You know, you could really stretch it if you sped up some docking tunes. You could hear a little bit of cloak in there, just a little bit, because it just has that vibe to it. But um, well, look, I have in the links, I put, uh, I believe I have everything. If I'm missing something, Scott. You have to check after the the broadcast and and see if I'm missing anything that you want in there. I'm, let me look. Well, I can't actually look at it. You will have to look at it afterward. But I've got you know the Instagrams. I've got uh, the Bandcamp. I believe I've got. I, the one thing I didn't find was like a proper website. Uh, just cloakatlanta.com. Okay, well then I'll 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 add that in. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there was anything else. Oh, I know. I did want to ask one other thing. So you brought up the darkness and all that kind of stuff like that. I kind of wanted to ask you a little bit. I assume you like write the lyrics mostly. Yeah. What, um, are there's certainly sort of, I guess a, an occult sort of vibe to a lot of the, the lyrics as far as mysticism and, you know, that kind of things like that. But what, what, um, what's your interest level in all that stuff and, and where it is, how does that influence you as far as writing lyrics and maybe, how the lyrics may or is the music always come first and then the lyrics later or yeah, yeah. No, you don't have melody lines in your head that you translate to, to chords or no? Uh, not usually. Um, as far as an interest, yeah, it's my my spiritual way of viewing the world. So it's it's more than just an interest. It's what guides me. Um, so yeah, it's it's what the band was based off of, and it's what we aim to to do and to. Uh, evoke with our music so that's yeah it's it's but, uh, but there's not i mean there's not a lot of like outright satanic sort of stuff going on there that i could hear maybe i didn't i didn't read the lyrics but uh you know. well it's not maybe outright but it's it's there uh written about in a way that's not just naming demons out of a 
uh, book. book. Um, it's the way that I view those principles, though. So. Are you much yeah. of uh, much into like the Cthulhu mythos, like the ne Necrono Necronomicon, and that, that kind of stuff, or is that not really not, not really? Um, I think it's entertaining to read about, but uh, that's you know a little more on the um, fictional side of things. It's cool in like a morbid angel way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he was really into it. Well, I mean, there's like, yeah, of course, Trey. And then have you heard of the band Sulfur Aeon? No. You might want to check them out. I really might have heard the name, but I don't think I've heard them. Uh, check them out. Sulfur Aeon, really, really killer. And they're all just Cthulhu. And it's very, it's deathy black metal that's just dripping with, dripping with atmosphere, man. Oh, and, and I hear a little bit of, you know, some similarities. Like that would be a cool band for you guys to maybe hook up with if you went over to Europe or something. Like I don't know how much they tour, but um, that's, a, that's a European band. Or yeah, they're German. German actually. Yeah, they have four. I think they have four albums out. They might be around a little before you. Twenty twelve, I think, is okay. when they. I think there's another there. cool band out there called Chapel of Disease. That's a uh, yeah. Danish, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know them as well as I know Sulfur, but I just listened to Sulfur a lot the last week or two. I bought everything that I, they have, and I knew about them like before, but but their newest album came out in like August, I think, or September, and I was like, man, why don't I own the other albums? And I went and just dropped, you know, I don't know, hundred bucks or whatever on their. You can't get their shit in the states very easily. You got to get it through Van Records over in Germany. Yeah, that's a great label. Uh, ah store web store yeah yeah van van is killer deborah Mormorty. i'm a big blue yeah. are you a fan of blood ass nord um not so much uh max is and i think our uh drummer sean is as well but um they're good well, I just, let me ask you this if do you have a cd player in the car or do you use your phone now uh yeah i have a cd player too all right if we jumped in your car what five cds would we find in your car just assume uh, that you had some there Mm, it's probably well i do use a phone in my car um <laughs> right now there's megadeth rust in peace in there there's our own because i listened to it in the car to test it out every time right. we get a new album and i've never taken it out so that's <laughs> in there not in a pompous way i got you i mean my last played things today were the first deicide record uh annihilation time which I think is a band from Pittsburgh. I don't know that. Um, Mob Rules by Sabbath. I've been oh. in the Dio era lately. Um, oh, man. And yeah, like Onslaught and stuff like that. But I, yeah, I've been um, going through these audiobooks, uh, rock memoirs, and I did the Geezer Butler one. So I've been yeah. on like Sabbath, going back and re listening to those. So yeah, I just grabbed um, Headless Cross. Which is a one of my favorite Sabbath albums. So, oh, so good, man. The, the song "When Death Water. Calls," when Death yeah. Calls, just Devil and Honor. Uh, I can go on about like we probably got to end it, but we could talk another hour on Headless Cross. We we printed <laughs> me and Max printed like bootleg shirts of the Headless Cross album. Where we fucking love that album. Every, I try to turn everybody onto it because they've tried to like erase Tony Martin. Yeah, they have the man, but it's some of the best Sabbath material out there. It's, it's well, so what's your, what's your take on eternal idol now before you I say that. anything, I love to well, hang on, but do you know the Ray Gillen dem demos? I've, I've heard about him. I watched this, uh, that guy, Razor Fist, the metal mythos episode. Uh -huh. and he talks about that. Um, Dude, you gotta get, you gotta hear the Ray Gillen demos because he came in and covered for i think it was when gillen couldn't finish out the, the tour so related to ian gillen no he's not okay. ian, ian gillen is g-i-l-l-a-n okay. ray gillen is, is g-i-l-l-e-n and ray gillen actually went on to team up with jakey lee okay and they formed a band called badlands which was kind of like a zeppi oh, yeah. that first album in rules but ray gillen dude his voice is fucking insane on Check that it out. It's, stuff. martin's martin's i like that one a lot too he's got more of that dio range and to me like dio is arguably the best hard rock singer ever but yeah and martin's kind of got that range but um i gotta say i do I, I listened to born again yesterday to go back i do not like the born again record that i'm much. not it's my it's probably my least favorite of that Gillen, era Gillen can't 
It well, the production yeah. is weird too. I know. I know they. I think they were redoing something with that, or they yeah. remixed it, it or something. Sucks. It sucks. Oh, it's still not good. Yeah. 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 He he just couldn't. He just couldn't quite cut it. Like the songs are good, but yeah, the yeah, way he sings is just weird. Record. Yeah, the Seven Star record is better than that one, and that's a weird record for for Savage. With, but, with Glenn Hughes. Yeah, I I, I kind of like it, but um, I love yeah, Glenn Hughes. Yeah, I just don't like the Born and Grand record. But I'm a massive Tony Martin era fan, like Tear, mm -hmm. Eternal Idol, and Headless Cross. I hate to say I don't really know Tear. I've um, they're um check it out. Tony just said they're in May, I believe. You got a box set. The box set's yeah, finally yeah. coming out. Yeah, I took like straight up Headless Cross has been at the top two of my sabbath albums for the last couple of years like it's heaven and hell and, and headless cross right now Straight well the on. riffs man the riffs on headless cross and on heaven and hell too yeah. i mean let's be honest um just fucking insane and mob rules you can't run you can't take yeah, that out of the equation either. yeah it's but yeah i no. i prefer dio era sabbath over ozzy here uh, these days i do too um i mean i still love sabbath bloody sabbath that's my favorite Sabbath. Uh, that's and that and Sabotage are kind of my two favorites. Yeah, yeah. I just grabbed but, Sabotage on vinyl recently because I I only had it on cassette. But um, yeah, you, yeah, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath is my favorite with Ozzy. Um, I love. I mean, I love the Ozzy records. Don't get me wrong. I love. Oh, so records. do I. You can't. I got all the box sets. I had to. You know, once they yeah. came out, I'm like, fuck, man. Okay, here we go. Yeah, they're classic. But as far as like hard rock and toughness heaven and hell is such an amazing sabbath but it's kind of weird you brought up dio <clears> and <throat> i had to drive out to cleveland from where i live which is about a almost a six hour drive i had to go out there last thursday two weeks ago and i had bought the um there's a box set with like magica uh master of the moon uh is it dangerous machines or what's it called um not sure. Are you talking about Dio records or? Yeah, yeah. It's the later Dio, like after yeah. Lock Up the Wolves, right? Yeah. I've kind of only gone up to Wolves, but um. Well, yeah. it's weird. I didn't listen to those albums back when they came out. I just kind of, yeah. Oh, this other shit was happening, and I kind of got distracted. Some really good albums there, man. Especially yeah. um, yeah. Magica. Yeah, I'll check it out. You said yeah. you're in Cleveland. I am in. No, I'm outside of Philly. Oh, Philly, you said. Oh, so, yeah, I live I live in a place called Lancaster, PA. Which yeah, is, okay. Yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, um, it's kind of where all the Amish people are. <laughs> but yeah. I had to drive out to Cleveland, and we did all those the angry machines. Thank Rick. Rick. Um, yeah, Sebastian, it will be. No, it'll be live. You can just, or not live. You, it'll be archived. You can go check it out. And do me a favor, man. Spread this around. Like, post this. If you see this and you're watching it out there, the people are watching you know, send it around. It, it helps elevate my profile, helps elevate Cloak's profile, um, Scott's as well. So um, any anything more, Scott, that you want to hit on that we, we haven't, like, really dove into? No, not really. We opened up the, the Headless Cross uh, book, so that can go on forever, but we don't need to go down that road. Um, <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's cool. We have a lot of that old 80s stuff in common with, you know, Queen's Rank. Well, I mean, Cross, you know, I may be old. But you're never too old to rock and roll. Remember, it keeps, you young. It keeps you young. I still feel yeah. like I'm, I'm 16, so it's fine. Yeah, I, I, my mom often says to me, like, are you, you know, she's 80 now almost. She's like, are you ever going to grow up? I'm like, nah. Why? Then I get to die, you know, that kind of thing, right? But um, she's actually, it's funny because I, you know, I, I had a professional job for a lot of years. I've got a medical situation that had me, I had to retire. Uh, recently and uh, I'm on disability and she's like, are you ever going to get your haircut? I'm like, mom, I got my haircut all through high school because you made me. Yeah, exactly. And then when I went into college, my girlfriend was like, I didn't like your hair long. And then it was, you know, after college, I had to get a job where I had to be a professor. I'm like, I'll grow it down to my ass if I want to. Now, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. And no, music keeps you young. So. All right, man, hang loose one minute. And, uh, for everybody that tuned in and I think we had nine nine people on, which is pretty cool. Um, and this will this will pick up steam as it goes out there. And again, I'll I sent you the link, uh, Scott, if you want to post it on your Facebook or yeah, I, I posted Instagram it Instagram or whatever. Hopefully, people will uh pop in and, and check it out. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh hopefully you guys come around to Philly or Baltimore. Yeah, we'll, we'll be back. We'll be I back. generally stay out of New York. If I if I can now because it's just so 
it's so expensive, man. I mean, a horrible city to go in and out of. Yeah, dipping in to just see a show for three or four hours, you're, you're, you're talking, you're going to spend 150 bucks. And it's yeah. just like, do I really want to do that? No, when I can go to Philly or Baltimore is an hour away. So, yeah. um, and I was telling you, I, the horrendous guys are good buddies of mine. I went down to see them. I went to see them on Sunday and on Saturday. Do you know who Exist is? Mm, I don't think so. They're a ba- Max from Death to All. Yeah, Death to All, the, the, um, Steve Giorgio. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, Bobby yeah. Kobe. Max yeah. is the singer now that, and oh, I know you're talking he, about. Yeah. he also is in Cynic as well. He's the other guy in Cynic. Yeah. And so he has his own band called Exist. They're kind of like if Sound of Perseverance met, like, you know, Traced in Air or something like that. Very, you know, he, he doesn't shy away from his influences, but went to see them on Saturday. And that's just down and back for me. That's an hour in and out. You know, all it is gas for me. I can be in and out and enjoy. So if you guys come up, man, be cool to hang out with you, buy you a beer or something like that. Yeah. And um, you need any help with anything, man, you know where to get me and reach out to me and uh, you know, we'll look up. So hang on one sec. Everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, one quick note, a couple show notes. This Saturday at 3 p.m., so that is January 27th, myself – and John Holm from Angelock will be co-hosting with me, and we're going to be in. Uh, we're going to be interviewing Havard Jorgensen from Ulva. Over, as we Americans say, over. Uh, also, Satyricon and his own project. So we're going to be doing that on on a Saturday, and um, and there's other stuff coming, man. Some really really cool interviews are coming down the pike. So. Not that Scott wasn't cool. He was very cool. (laughs) But thank you to everybody for watching and tuning in. And um, I'm going to end the podcast now. So hang on one sec, Scott.